Hello and welcome to Wild Sound Civilized. You're... Are we monthly still? No. <laughs> Your podcast about music, literature, and everything betwixt. Today we're talking about Symphony Fantastique by Hector Berlioz, which is a thing. It is a thing. It is a fun thing. Yes, actually. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Okay, good. Because when I picked this one out, it was a bit of like a, what are we going to talk about? It's basically an hour of instrumental music. What is there to analyze? And I hope that you have found that there's a lot to analyze. I honestly didn't quite know what to do with this. Um, this is very much outside of my wheelhouse. But I enjoyed the listening experience quite a bit. Okay. Like, just as a person who does not listen to classical music, mm-hmm. like, that's not something I do for fun, right? <laughs> right, yeah. It was actually really fun to just, I put it on my computer, I sat down with the crochet project, mm-hmm. and I just watched this very intensely curly-haired conductor get really excited. Did and you watch the uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra? I think version? so. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and like it was just, it was fun to watch. Mm-hmm. So. Do you find it like, was the watching element like a really important part of that? Or do you think you would have had the same experience just listening? I think it held my attention more because I was watching it. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I just had it on in the background, I probably wouldn't have been paying attention quite as much. That's fair. Yeah, it's um, it's difficult, I think, for us to tackle an orchestral work. We hadn't done that yet. We had done Carmen, but Carmen, of course, has a text. It has words. It has a libretto that you can sort of break down and investigate. It's like a, a musical. Right. Whereas this doesn't have semantic meaning anywhere. <laughs> It's all fairly abstract. So this is a program symphony, which means that it has a story, even though it's a symphony. And this was shown in program notes created by Berlioz for the original performance that sort of outline the plot. And the plot, oh boy. (laughs) We're going to enjoy this one. Um, That is our prelude segment for today. We're trying out a new thing with segments and we're going to move on into our context segment. Uh, Symphony Fantastique. I should probably move closer to the mic if I'm also going to look down as I do this. Probably. Yep. (laughs) Um, So Symphony Fantastique, aka the Fantastical Symphony, an episode in the life of an artist in five parts, which is a mouthful of a title, I'm going to say. But not atypical for the time, although the five part, very atypical for the time. All right. So this was written by a French composer, uh, Hector Berlioz, yep. in 1830. It is described, <laughs> it is described as psychedelic or dreamlike in nature, possibly I, yeah. because I, part of it was composed while he was high on opium. I would really put the emphasis on psychedelic there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It really feels, it feels like an opium fever dream, to me at yeah. least. Because of all of your experience. On opium? Uh, obviously. <laughs> My experience as a 1800s lady just doing opium all the time. <laughs> the other life that I lived, clearly. It was revised <laughs> extensively in 1831 and 32 and wasn't published until 1845. And that 1845 version was pretty different from the 1830 original, um, which apparently can no longer be reconstructed today in full. Yeah, there's a couple of weird instrumentation choices that he made, and there's a couple of program notes that he actually, like, walked back later in life. So when originally it was written, there was this, I don't know, little essay to go with it, which had the plot summary. And the idea being that this is a program symphony, so you sit down and you read it and you listen and you have a better idea of the story going on. But later in life, he made some sort of comment to the effect that the music should just be viewed as music. It should just be listened to. And part of that, I think, is this weird pushback that classical music has towards program music. 
it's kind of thought of as lesser than. Like music should be abstract. Music should be absolute. They call it absolute music. And program music is lesser because it's trying to convey something or it's trying to go with something. And so him sort of negating his own program notes with the plot, uh, part of that is why it's like, well, what version do you perform, right? There's the 1830 that he wrote. There's the 1845 when it properly came out. And then there's the 1855 where he started walking things back. He wrote a weird little sequel that nobody knows. <laughs> and I don't know. It's like... I don't know how much of that to consider when talking about it, right? But he wrote it. <laughs> so what we were listening to, or what mm-hmm. the the Chicago orchestra that yep. performed it, um, what would they have been playing? Closer to the 1845s. Okay. Yeah. Part of the difficulty is that there's two harps in the second movement, and there's also like a weird solo trumpet part, I think, in like the fourth movement. And he had trouble even in his own lifetime instrumenting that or instrumenting arranging i'm missing a word here but getting two harpists to play just for that one movement and to play very well in parts of europe that were not conducive to creating harp players was really really difficult okay so even he did it several different ways just based on necessity which most composers did it's not like there was a a a need to create the absolute version every time it was more I'm being paid to do this, and i got to pull it off somehow. Right. Which I don't think many people think about when they're thinking of classical music. <laughs> <laughs> the plot, basically, it's about a gifted artist with a big imagination um, that has poisoned himself with opium in the depths of despair because he is hopelessly in love, and that love is unrequited. <laughs> so there was actually a note in the program notes He described this like melancholy feeling of the main character as, and I quote, a vagueness of passion. Yes. Unquote. I kind of love that. Like, (laughs) I don't love the main character, I'll be honest with you. But the vagueness of passions. I think I've been there. Vagueness of passions. Just feels that you can't put your finger on. Yeah. I feel like... Everybody was 15 once. Mm-hmm. This is a little bit emo, <laughs> I would say. If someone were to ask me, hey, I really love my chemical romance. How do I get started in classical music? I would say, well, friend, let me tell you about Hector Berlioz. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think that conversation is ever going to happen. No, probably not. <laughs> But you have it there for one day. It's ready. Yes. Have ready. Yep. Okay, so there are five movements, which I feel like we can probably think about as visions. Visions. I kind of think of them as like acts. Like if it's not like a three-act structure, but there's definitely like a, I don't want to say a five-act structure. There's, there's a progression to them. They tell a story all together consecutively, but they are each sort of a different setting, a different a different backdrop. So they're they're not actually happening though, right? It's all in his imagination. Like each of these movements is him imagining something about this I beautiful woman. I have a theory. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I have a theory. I have a theory that the first three are real or based in reality. And that the final two are real messed up. It's just bonkers. Just bonkers. I think it could almost even be interpreted as a descent. Like at the beginning, things are somewhat based in reality, and as you go forth, they just get crazier and crazier and crazier. Um, Because in the beginning, all that really happens is he's just lamenting his fate as a poor, sad, self-pitying young man with a vagueness of passion (laughs) (laughs) who finds this lovely, beautiful, perfect woman that he has yet to meet or speak to, (laughs) which we will discuss later and at some point they're at a ball and then they're well he's out in a field with shepherds and and it it feels like there's a reality there and Mm -hmm. it's just in the last two movements where he's witnessing his own execution yep and then present for his funeral which is also a witch's sabbath yeah there was something about an orgy just like a horrible this thing is great i love the fifth movement (laughs) Like, 
I feel like when we were listening to this and I was getting ready, I was like, Symphony Fantastic, I know this, I know what's up here. Listen to it at the beginning, yep, that's what I remember, yep. Mm -hmm. And as it went on, I got more of like a, ooh, that's, hmm, that's spicy, that's good, ooh, I'm a fan. And it got to the fifth movement and I just sat and listened. I just thoroughly enjoyed the whole spooky thing. It will be so great for Halloween. <laughs> it's just absolute psychedelic nuttery. I'm a fan. I mean, <laughs> witches and classical music is one of my extremely niche interests. I'm, I'm there. I'm there for it. Big fan. Mm. 10 out of 10. Fifth movement. <laughs> so to recap, the first one is his like passions. Yeah. His vague passions. The second movement is a ball, as yeah. in like a dance. A very like glamorous, very like waltz, right? Very rich. Yeah. It's in a it's in three eight time, so it's a waltz, but it's a little bit different than a normal waltz. It's just a little bit it's just slightly different. A usual waltz would be in three four. Yeah. And this is in three eight. Yeah. And it has those two harps that make everything sound really like lush and exciting and something very glamorous about it. And then you move into movement three, which is like this pastoral in a field. I've always kind of imagined this one at dusk, mm. where it's like just reflecting on nature and the peace of the natural order. And in some way, I think the peace of the natural order of having a mate. And at some point midway through, this absolute asshole imagines that the object of his affections will or has betrayed him and just the whole piece sort of devolves and sinks down into that really like murky vagueness of passions <laughs> <laughs> um, that the first movement kind of had more of and then it just sort of peters out and you end with just this like low thunderclap sound from the mm -hmm. timpani and you hear like the thunder clouds coming in and you're like oh no what's gonna happen And then movement four, he has imagined, and this is where I think the break comes from reality, that he has killed the object of his affections. He has murdered her out of jealousy of her imagined betrayal because this guy's an asshole. <laughs> and is present for his execution. And I'm not sure if this is just the way I imagined it or if this is present in the program notes, I didn't write this down, but I imagine that he experiences it as an out-of-body experience. I think, um, no, I thought I, I thought I read that too. He witnesses his own execution. Yeah, so. like witnesses and doesn't feel. I think this is also the one that a lot of people described as where he ODs on opium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would assume it's an out-of-body experience. He feels out-of-body-ish and he's being executed and um, he's being marched up to the scaffold and there's the executioner there and it's it's very it's very ominous, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> Gives way to movement five, the best time ever. It's a witch's Sabbath. Um and also an orgy. And I'm not sure if the devil's there or if he's crashing the party late. I thought the devil was there. And I think he might be there. she's having sex with the devil now? Yeah, okay. So backtrack for a second to provide context. Mm. The lady, the object of his affections, because I feel weird calling him, calling her his lover or his beloved. I, the object of his affections. Yeah. Um, she has this theme that's used throughout the piece, an idee fix or fixed idea, I apologize for my French, that there's this little musical theme, it's sort of like a, a bit of a scale and a bit of an arpeggio that represents her, that's sort of throughout the whole piece. Imperial March in Star Wars, where you have that dun 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 every time Darth Vader walks into the room. Difference here being that there isn't anything cinematic happening, 
it's that piece of music that you hear warped and changed and moved that gives you the feeling of what's going on with her throat. And in the fifth movement, oh boy, it becomes this like demented jig of like jolly Satanism. <laughs> and I oh, thoroughly enjoyed it. becomes like a, a parody, right? A lot mm. of the fifth movement is about parody. There's a Dies Irae, which is like a medieval hymn that was very holy about sort of the end of days that is satirized in the fifth movement. It is made silly <laughs> by Satan. <laughs> It's so exciting. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things that are happening. It's so different from I mean even compared to the first movement. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think that there is a progression of unreality throughout the five. In that the first movement is very like I'm a sad boy. I'm not a happy boy. But it sounds very conventional to our ears, even though it was fairly revolutionary for the time, especially the form. But by the time you get to the fifth movement, it's like so many conventions are being thrown out of the window that you're just like along for the ride. I like, was that your experience of it? Or was it like, a, oh, classical music, something's happening. That, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But I'm not familiar with the genre, I guess, enough yeah. to be like, this is a real deviation. Like, this is really yeah. radical. And you would have to be familiar with not just the genre, but the genre leading up to Symphony Fantastic because it did change so many things that then became convention afterwards. So even if you're familiar with like late romantic works, you would listen to this and be like, oh, sounds like a late romantic work, but it isn't. It's an early romantic work. <laughs> Whoa. So how is this received? Um, you know what? That's something that I didn't even look into. I didn't either. I just assumed that everybody was like, wow, yes. But uh, now that I think about that. I would assume the opposite. I Yeah, maybe now. In Satan context, orgy. <laughs> maybe that wouldn't be received quite so well now that I think about it. But the other <laughs> element here, maybe why it would be received a little bit better, is that romanticism in general was about extremity of emotion and extremity of feeling and was based kind of around this movement called Sturm und Drang, mm. which came out of Germany. And it was a reaction to the Enlightenment, which held rationality as, you know, the the most objectively good way to view the world. And so romanticism with that Sturm und Drang movement was about feeling completely and feeling complexly and feeling a lot, which is why it became fashionable for ladies to faint when overwhelmed with emotion, okay. or it became fashionable to read poetry, or it became fashionable to have to write flowery prose to each other about the, the nature of one's love, which I wish had never gone out of fashion, but it did. <laughs> so in context, then, this piece of music, which is a melancholy young man, oh, such melancholy. It makes sense in a romantic viewpoint. And it also makes sense that he's taking opium and he's falling in love with a woman at first sight and then he's viewing his own execution and going to a witch party. Like it, this is a work that could only exist in the Romantic era. If it came out like 70 years earlier, I, I, I mean, I, I would love to hear what happened, but I don't think it would have went well for Berlioz in a very real physical way. <laughs> And if it had come out, say, a hundred years later, it would have been embarrassingly earnest and embarrassingly emotional. Okay. So it's in this exact crossfire where it is current, it is contemporary to have your emotions on your sleeve and to display them in this over-the-top way. 
which the main character does not come out well in no. this. Not at all. And that is also context. Yes. <laughs> but um, I was wondering if you looked into the real life of Berlioz and saw how how the the cell for an insert did in real I life. I looked into this a little bit. Okay. So Berlioz fell in love with an actress, um, Harriet Smithson, I think. Yeah. And so he saw her play Ophelia in 1827. His first version of this was 1830, right? Yeah. So he sees her, he writes this thing, and he sends her a bunch of love letters, which she ignores. Because, you know, it's the same as getting, like, DM'd by strangers on the internet, right? Oh, yeah. She's like, I'm a public figure. Why would I want this, right? Who are you? Um... And it's important to note that they hadn't met. Yes. They, like, he wrote this piece. They had not met. Yeah. They they don't meet for a while. No. I'm pretty sure that he writes this. It's out. People are consuming it. And then she sees it. Yeah. And uh, I heard something really frustrating. I can't remember if it was on the Wikipedia article for this or if it was in one of the, like, sources. Um, but it was definitely present while I did my lazy research. And... It said, oh, what did this sentence say? It was like, though they hadn't met, um, she met with Berlioz after realizing the genius of Symphony Fantastique. Yes. I feel Something like... to that effect where it was like, no, what? No, what? Yes, I, I remember the word genius being put in there. So basically he had a huge crush on this celebrity. Stranger. 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 And um, they end up married. And miserable. And then... The marriage broke down. Yeah. It was terrible. But I think midway through writing, he got a crush on a different lady. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And started writing it for her. But then, when it was finished, dedicated it to, get this, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. What? Yeah. So it's not dedicated to Harriet Smithson. It's not dedicated to the other lady whose name I've forgotten. It is dedicated to the Tsar of Russia. Wasn't he a French composer? Yeah. But Russia had a big like love affair with France. Okay. Russia was like, France, let's be you. And France was like, whatever. Because that's what France does. <laughs> yes, I know. <note. laughs> but, and then after it was done and dedicated to Tsar Nicholas I, she heard it, got in touch with him, and then he was in love with her again. So he's a very fickle man. I think he's a mess. <laughs> I think, like, it's very apparent when listening with modern ears that the, the woman represented here is not a character. She is a figment of the composer's imagination. For sure. This idée fix, as much as it's warped and changed, it's warped and changed by his perceptions and not through anything of her own. There's no point where the Ide Fix does something that seems like the woman performing her own agency. It is only a demented version because she's dancing with witches. Or it's a mirrored version because they're in the ball and they're all excited, having a happy time. Or it's a wistful version because he's out with shepherds, or it's a weird, not so happy version because he's realizing she possibly could betray him. It's entirely influenced by his state of mind and has no influence itself in the work. Mm. Which is interesting because it's a collection of notes and yet it's a character. Yeah. But not a character. Yeah. But it could be a character. Just a collection of notes. <laughs> but yeah, they got married. They broke up, did not sound like it went well in no. general for anybody, and he went back to his opium ways that he never stopped. Just a happy ending for all. Yep. <laughs> um, what was your interpretation of the Ide fix while listening to it? Like, did you hear it? Did it come out at you? Do you feel like it was something that you were aware of? I'm gonna be honest, no. Okay, cool. I I don't know if it's because it does change each time. 
Yeah. And like because you're listening to it over an hour, mm -hmm. if you're not looking for it, you don't know that this melody is going to change and yeah. you're going to see it in different places. Yeah. I'm also just really bad at <laughs> music. I, like I can't pick out lyrics. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if like if you gave it to anybody else, if you mm -hmm. literally have the worst person ask about this melody sitting across from you. <laughs> it could be. Um, because I didn't notice that recurring mm -hmm. in each one. Yeah, and even if it is recurring, you might just interpret it as sort of the backbone of the piece. Right. And it might not it might just seem stylistic and not thematic. But this is something that movies do to great effect. And something that I felt like, I had a little private theory, that a modern listener would be more primed to pick up on that, even if it's being used to soundtracks, than maybe even a listener in the era that it came out, considering that lead motifs, which is what that is, it's like a little motif for a specific character or place, mm. were not as common as they are now in soundtracks. Okay. So going back to Peter and the Wolf, yes. where the different instruments and melodies yes, exactly. equal clear characters, yep. I didn't get that here. Cool. Yeah, I would say Peter and the Wolf is the training wheels for noticing that, because they're literally being like, this is the duck. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and so you, you, you hear it much clearer. This would be the more difficult version of that, where you're picking it out. It's a thread that's in there and sometimes it's so changed and warped that you don't even notice it which is cool because it's like a little treasure hunt for mm -hmm. easter eggs where can i find this theme and sometimes it's really obvious you hear it in that first little bit i find it obvious the first entry and again obvious in the fifth one where it's the funky little jig but definitely i don't think like a required a required thing to hear what the piece is about mm -hmm. would you agree I think so, yeah. I think, yeah. No, maybe. I, I would say if overall you're looking at the descent, mm -hmm. I think you can definitely get that out of the piece without knowing that you're looking at the descent of this object of affection yeah. to the dirty whore. And yeah. those are another academic's words, not yeah. mine. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, and we have moved into our next segment, yes. which I'm forgetting to announce because this is our first time trying these segments out so let us know if they're working for you or not but our next segment is counterpoints the things that we didn't necessarily like or the things that we'd like to argue with about yes. the work that made sense right yes oh yeah one aspect of this was definitely the feminist angle yeah figuring out uh, this lady is given no agency even realizes the genius of the composer is realize the most passive way to put that? I think it is. Yeah. I think that is the most passive way to put that. But the other thing I really wanted to talk about was postmodernism in terms of is the author dead? Are those program notes that he wrote and then decided not to include later part of the text? Or is the text just the music? And if they're not part of the text, could we infer our own thought entirely for this piece of music or does it have its own meaning and is it clear enough what the story is about without that text? Again, <laughs> I'm generally, so my English lit background is generally pro the author is dead. Um, I don't think we were ever encouraged to do a biographical reading throughout my whole degree, wow. which does vary from school to school, um, but everybody at the University of Western Ontario encouraged dead author approach. Wow. Um, You'll notice that's not the thing they do in classical music. No, <laughs> no. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I prefer that the author stay dead because I fully believe that even if like, you can totally disagree with yourself. Like, with lived experience, I can go back and watch a video of mine from five years ago. I'd be like, who is this person? I don't, I don't even yeah. agree with this argument that I was fully sold of on at yeah. the time, right? So, like, how many years later, how can we yeah. even say that when the artist wrote this, as it was performed, as it was adapted? So... 
in this case then, do you feel like if you had had no background and you listened to it, you would get the same sort of themes and ideas coming through as you would if you had read the program notes? I feel like you definitely get the sense of a descent. Mm -hmm. Like it starts out melancholic, you have the waltz, which is very like, it's smooth. I do ballroom dance. So like, we, oh, we'll, get, about that. we'll get the waltz, right? Um, you get the shepherd thing that ends in the storms. So you get that something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And then it just gets weird and wacky and darker. So like, I feel like you still get the essence of that story mm -hmm. through the feeling of each movement. Yeah, I think if I didn't have program notes, I think that it could still be definitely inferred that it's a story about addiction. Yeah? I think that that still would ring pretty clear. And I mean, realistically, it is a story of addiction and not of love. Yeah. I definitely think the witch's Sabbath would come through. I do think that some of the execution units of the fourth movement, especially those like rhythms, mm. would come through. I feel like the pastoral scene, you're right, there's definitely like a, a descent that occurs during that one. It really does read as a, a tale of addiction, I think, without the program notes. You have like a sad, melancholy, lethargic thing going on. You have this bright, glamorous, glittering thing going on in movement two. You have peace, calm, descent, thunderstorms, oh no, what's going on in three. You have an execution in four, and you have insanity in five. But I also don't know if that's as universal a story as could be applied to something else. Like, could it also be used in perspective of journeying to hell? Could it be a story about a terrible breakup with Satan? All the things. I wonder if there's a point in breaking up what we consider program music and absolute music if we were to consider the author being dead anyways. I'm trying to digest that. <laughs> um, okay, so what I, what we did with this were read two academic articles mm -hmm. where they interpret the music and like yeah. they analyze the story specifically from the music. Do yeah. people do that to music that doesn't have so okay. they do, but it's more abstract. So like, I'm trying to think of an example. We haven't really covered anything else like this, but let's say we were analyzing um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It has that a famous opening. Dun, 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 dun. And that has been interpreted as fate knocking at the door. There's no program notes about that. There's no hint that it's kind of about that. That's just an interpretation that is widely held. There's not really a story going on there. It's more like vignettes and ideas and stories and repetitions that occur in different ways to create a mood or a feeling or uh, an abstract idea. Mm. Whereas program music would be Peter and the Wolf. Yeah. I mean, Peter and the Wolf without the speaking. It's very programmatic. Um, or if you know... Uh, Peer Gint by Grieg in the Hall of the Mountain King. Oh, okay. Okay. It's like he's creeping into the, the troll's cave and he's getting higher and he's getting bigger and he's like, oh, it's a troll! Bam! I, okay, I recognize that now, but I didn't know the story <laughs> behind it. Yeah, it is program music again. And in that same little first half of Peer Gint, there's also Morning Mood. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 the other two aren't as famous, but are very good, especially Anitra's dance. Oh, oh, oh boy, <laughs> I'm getting off topic. But if there is no story from the author that is separate from the music that we are going to include as part of the text, and we're not going to include the author's ideas or notes or letters about the topic, then does that mean that we should interpret music entirely abstractly? or be inventing our own stories for it. It sounds like that's what people do, if that's what happens with something like Beethoven's Fifth. Yeah, I think it's not quite a story that's happening, but it is definitely trying to put something in words that I think 
I mean, it's difficult in any way to put music into words. It's, I think, as close as thought, as close to thought as you can get while not being still inside of your head. <laughs> you can get an idea, an emotion out there for other people to experience. But, yeah, there is this divide between program music and absolute music. And I'm just trying to reconcile, like, should it be there? Why is it there? <laughs> I feel like it would be more fun if you weren't limited to program. I agree, and yet the program gives you the best story outline. Mm. Like, I can't, I can invent a story to go along with anything, but sometimes it's nice to have that outline there so that you can be listening for little things, be listening for specific feelings about something going on rather than I'm trying to figure out what happened oh it got sad that means something bad happened what bad happened I don't know like there's an there's an extra level of effort involved I think in coming up with something to go along with it as a ghost like I just don't think it's realistic to expect listeners to do that I don't know maybe most listeners who are educated in this would be looking for that but as an outsider if you listen to it I wonder if the sort of feelings it creates going back to your mm -hmm. your comment about it being the closest to thoughts without the limits of language mm -hmm. um, I wonder if just what it emotes in each listener that baggage that you bring mm -hmm. is maybe more important than having any sort of story outline yeah no, you're making a strong case for absolute music. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to talk about how it relates to modern movie soundtracks. Yeah. Because, as I was saying, I kind of already showed my hand here, but the Ide Fix, the leitmotif, is something that's used a lot nowadays. There's a lot of conventions that were broken for this piece that are now just, like, common. They're the type of thing you hear all the time. Especially this sort of, I don't want to call it onomatopoeia, but it's almost automatic, yeah. Like that timpani thunder mm. roll, or in the fifth movement when the string players are playing col agneau to get that spooky skeleton sound, where they play with the wood of the bow rather than the hair of the bow. Okay. And so it sounds all bony. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But these, these sort of sound effects, these really colorful ideas that are thrown into the mix almost like as part of the sound effects of a movie. And a lot of just the playfulness, the willingness to take a theme and take it in like nine different directions. I, it's very cinematic. It's so cinematic that I want a movie version. There is a movie version from like the 40s or something and I don't think it's really related to it at all, but I want like a Fantasia. I want a Tim Burton Fantasia of this. Imagine. That. No, Guillermo del Toro. I want a Guillermo del Toro Fantasia of Symphony Fantastique. Now I'm kind of stuck on Tim Burton now. No, Guillermo del no. Especially okay. the witch's orgy. Yeah, no, Guillermo del Toro for that part, though. Imagine all the spooky creatures. Does he do spooky quite as well as Tim Burton does, though? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Have you seen Pan's Labyrinth? That spooky it's guy not, with the not in a hand, long time. eye balls, and he's all like... <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Oh, man, Nightmare Speed. Or, um... In Hellboy, there's all these like background characters that are like really just messed up looking animatronics. Or what else? He did like a whole bunch of horror, I know, before he got into okay. the, like more mainstream stuff. And I would love to see like a really just messed up Fantasia ish, but not Fantasia, not for children <laughs> version of this. I think it would be really good. I think it would also help folks like me yeah. pick out that... Ide fix? Yes. Yeah, and even just pick up in the themes in general, right? Like, I'm kind of zoning in on that one because I think it's the easiest to sort of parse, but there's other things that are happening that are implying things that could very easily be paired with visuals to create a complete artwork, which we should talk about Wagner at some point because we can talk a lot about complete artworks, but... Another episode, another time. But I just, that would be so good. Mm. That would be so good. You wouldn't mm. even have to do it like a silent film like Fantasia. You could totally do a movie, full length, 
because this is 50 minutes of music and just have the music sort of guide the story along and don't take any of it out right are you envisioning because now i'm trying to picture this dialogue in between like a yeah. story i can totally see dialogue in between and then just the okay we learned this on which please the diegetic music and the what is the other one non-diegetic Sure, the opposite of diegetic. <laughs> that doesn't sound very academic. No, I wouldn't want <laughs> any music other than Symphony Fantastique to be used. I would literally not want a composer on the film because they would just remix it. Right. So would it be silence when there isn't music or would you time the whole film to be the 52 minutes? I would go silence when there isn't music. I think you'd have to be careful about the timing and I would be lenient if they chose to like cut in between like there's definitely a few places where it ebbs and flows in mm -hmm. each movement like in the first one where you could very clearly do like an opening in that first little bit do something super sweeping lots of cool visuals cut conversation music keeps going like that would make sense to me um i don't know i'm just i'm waiting why why am i still waiting <laughs> this is this should be a thing right like i'm not going nuts that would be great wouldn't it it wouldn't be a blockbuster hit, but it would definitely get you into some film festivals. Okay, fair. <laughs> I just feel like, to me, when I listen to this, this is so cinematic, and I think so much in terms of visuals, as I sort of zone out and lock into the sound, that it would just be a treat for a director to work on. Hmm. You've got this story, you've got this music, it's all so rich and there's so much going on, that you really just get to be a painter. You get to just plan these beautiful shots and figure out the timing. And I, and there are composers that I think that I think I would trust to re-instrument it if that was like totally necessary. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of Danny Elfman in the fifth movement, especially with that colonial part. No, no Danny Elfman. For for listeners and for myself, who is Danny Elfman? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get Just so name good. dropping. <laughs> okay, so Danny Elfman is like Tim Burton's longtime um, music person. Okay, that's music. why the name sounds familiar. Yeah, so he did like Edward Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, Corpse Bride. Corpse probably. Bride. Yeah, he did the Simpsons theme song. <laughs> did he really? Yeah. Um, and he did. I mean, my favorite soundtrack of his is Edward Scissorhands, where it's got all sorts of weird children's choir stuff, some funky sounds. It's just very good. Very good, but very spooky. And spooky in the same way that this fifth movement is spooky. Okay. And the first movement is so melancholy and dreary and moving along, but it's very, like, almost impressionist in the way it just sort of washes around. I think there's a couple, there's a couple of modern film composers that I think could do something with that. It's just, like, there's no real movie version. Mm. Like, Peter and the Wolf, how many versions did we have to pick from? Carmen, how many versions did we have to pick from? Symphony Fantastique? Here we all are. Yep. And our, our one movie version from the 40s, which has no information on IMDb and is not on Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay. Awful. Just doesn't even exist not on wikipedia who are you <laughs> <laughs> um i'm wondering okay so public perception of classical music is obviously not that it's very cool but this is a psychedelic sex drugs and classical music do you feel like that perception makes sense in light of that do you feel like this is something more academic do you feel like this is something i, I don't know what's your perception of this piece in those terms. Okay. So you described it as sex, drugs, and classical music. My Close favorite phrase. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, this doesn't strike me as particularly sexy. Okay, yeah. Fair. Um, not just because of the weird creepy stalker yeah. Yeah. angle, but... It's um, creepy. Just, I, I don't know that I've ever described 
or that I would ever describe, except for maybe that bit from Carmen. Yes. Classical music as sexy. Really? Maybe Tell I... Tell me more. <laughs> what? <laughs> maybe I'm doing it wrong. But uh, I, I don't think that... Like... I don't hear the sex in classical music the same way that you hear sex in rock or pop music. Is that fair? That is fair. I think I get that to a certain degree. I just think that there's a witch's orgy in this one. I know, but it sounds more bonkers. I don't want to be part of that orgy. I, like, right. that sounds dangerous. I mean, not that, like, they're <laughs> accepting volunteers, but... It, I just wonder what that break is between something that sounds sexy and something that is a sound about sex. Right. Like jazz is sexy. Mm -hmm. But so I I feel like there's something in every genre that's a little bit sexy, but jazz is mainly like textural in my mind. I guess maybe texture is sexy, but if texture is sexy, then hello French horn. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Okay. What about okay? What about Carmen though? What about when she comes out, snaps her fingers, has her Rihanna moment, and sings about being a rebellious bird? Maybe it's voice versus instrumentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Like you can hear. This is maybe a, this is a weird sentence that I never thought would come out of my mouth. You can hear the sex in her voice in a way that I don't hear the sex in the witch's orgy in like just right. the instruments so it sounds sanitized in some way i almost wonder if the sex there feels dangerous mm. in yeah. the way like teens don't have sex you will get pregnant yeah. and die also i don't know and maybe this is me being a little bit ignorant but if berlioz wasn't married at that point maybe he hadn't had sex. Done the deed. <laughs> um, well, he's on drugs, so I would imagine that yeah, he's, he's done the deed. Done mm -hmm. The devil's dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like there is a lot of classical music that is just like intrinsically like sexual. But maybe this isn't the best example. Maybe we will come back with a better example and I'll be like, look at this. It's real sexy. Next February, yeah. we'll do a whole podcast episode on sexy classical music. I feel like we just said sexy about 50 times. Mm -hmm. I've said sexy now more than I've ever in my entire life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> totally get the drugs, though. Yes. I get the drugs, yes. like, high part. Yeah, it's just, I guess what I'm asking is, why isn't this cool? Why am I not cool? Emily, what's not cool about this? To modern audiences? Yeah. I think because it doesn't feel new. Like, in context, mm -hmm. he's breaking a lot of boundaries. Yeah. In context now, it. do you know what I mean? It's not... Yeah. I mean, I hear that, but I don't know. I feel like sexy is sexy. Like, I will listen to uh, Hildegard's classic medieval piece, uh, Canticles of Ecstasy, and hot dang, keep it in your nun habit, Hildegard, because <laughs> it's real good, but a lot. And it's very like clear to me in a way that maybe it's not as clear here. I don't know. Maybe we just need to pull from better examples. You know, I'm going to write that down. We should come <laughs> back to this. We are going to one day compare sexy... Nun music. What was that called? Okay, so Hildegard of Bingen, or Bingen, she's like one of my favorite composers of all time. She was this crazy lady nun who was like a theologist who became like a mother superior of a convent and was also like a prophet. And she's revered in like Christian circles for basically being the best ever. But in music circles, she was also, get this, the best ever. And she wrote this piece, Canticles of Ecstasy, which I'm fairly certain is just entirely singing monophonic music about the female orgasm. 
Definitely. In like 1180. We need to talk about this. Oh, I'm never not <laughs> talking about it. Hildegard. Oh, my love. I think at one point, I thought I was going to be cool enough to get a tattoo, and I was intending on getting um, some of her original like manuscripts. But I'm not cool enough to get a tattoo, and I don't really ever want one. But if I did, that's what I would get. <laughs> okay. So listeners, look forward to that at some point in the future. Yay! I think that's everything, so we can go into the coda. Uh, yes. Um, did we talk about, did we cover my experience with it? Oh, not really. As an oh. outsider person? No, what, what your was your experience yeah. as an outsider? Like, what are you specifically interested in? I in terms? like, I feel, and I'm going to use a metaphor because I'm just tired and just very metaphorical you know when you have somebody over to your house for the first time and you think that your house doesn't have like a smell that smells like your house but you know that it must and so you're like questioning your friend you're like does what what does my house like smell like like what is it like what's the vibe like what as an outsider what do you think that's what i'm asking okay i thought this was a lot of fun <laughs> like i i did think it was a lot of fun i did come into this a little bit worried and i don't know if i've already said this off the top of the podcast i can't mm-hmm. remember possibly like, I, I worried about what I would be able to contribute to this because I also didn't know what to do with it. Mm. But I think doing the research for it was interesting to see. So I read two academic articles. One was Nicholas Don, Don Levy's MA thesis, and one was Miriam Lensky's PhD thesis or dissertation. Um, and it was interesting to see music academics pulled this piece apart in the same way that I would pull apart a text. Like, the same way that I would pull apart word choice and be like, this has this meaning, this comes from this word, and ooh, bam, explosion, this nuance is in this (laughs) thing based on this word choice. Um, And you watch these people do the same thing with, like, melody or chords and it was just like this like mind blown yeah. moment for me of like this was a fun thing that I sort of skimmed the surface of until I started reading about how people Deep engaged with yeah. yeah. Were there any big differences between the way they were analyzing this and the way you would go through a piece of written work? I think it's hard to say because you don't see their their background work. Um, in the same way that you don't see like my process for writing an essay, which is usually marking the crap out of my book so that it's not legible to other humans, pulling, <laughs> pulling all the key quotes and then developing an argument. So like, I'm curious about their process. Like, did they, did they have the score? Mm. Did they listen to it over and over again? Probably a bit of both, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, they were probably um, doing score study, where you have like a bound book, mm. but instead of words, there's music. So it's rather than like you've you've seen like a music book where yeah. it's like big and it's meant to be like put up on a music stand. Score study, it's like they look like novels. Okay. And they're just they're published differently. It's really interesting actually that they do that. Um, and you would probably read along and sort of listen to it in your head, or you would listen to it as you read. Okay. The score study. So probably a fairly similar process there too. A fairly similar process, yeah. It's not radically different, but I do think, like just based on our conversation about postmodernism, <laughs> that there's a movement forward that's happened in, I think, literary circles in that the author is dead that maybe has not necessarily happened in classical music or has been much slower to happen, where there's still a lot of like great man history And it is dying out. I'm not saying, like, this is the standard. Everybody learns about the life of Beethoven, but everybody learns about the life of Beethoven. (laughs) It's, um, there's still a focus on these select geniuses through history Mm. and less on the work itself and sort of the touchstones through movements. I don't know. It's, It's tricky to describe, but I see a lot more just from a speaking freedom in the way you interpret things than the way that I think, especially like let's say 20 years ago, the way music was analyzed. 
think both of these were also fairly old, if I'm not mistaken. Like, one was 97 or 95. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, one looked like a physical dissertation that the university had digitized by photocopying it. (laughs) And, like, scanning it into their database. Old school. Um, There was never a printed copy of that, like, of my dissertation, right? It's entirely digital. Wow. Yeah. That is fun. I hope that music history sort of changes, in the way, and it is changing anyway, but it changes in the way that it's talked about to be a little bit more centered in the experiences of people now, because I think that's the only way it has to stay relevant. I wonder if part of the accessibility, maybe why it isn't mm-hmm. cool to go back to that, yep. um, is that you feel like you need the history. Yeah. Like to come into this, it's classical. Yeah. Right? It's well, up it's, it's up on a pedestal. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I get this a lot with people who feel like they don't have a right to analysis yeah. almost because yep. they don't have the schooling. Like fuck the schooling. Like it's your experience. Like yeah. you're the person totally. engaging with this text. And I don't know that that barrier has been broken down in the same way. No, I don't think it has. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I don't know. How do you tell people that they have permission to get into something and get their hands dirty and take it apart? You have permission. You have our permission. <laughs> Please do this. Um, welcome to the CODA, where we are going to talk about a couple of related things, some takeaways, things to check out that are related, but not exactly this work. Off the top, if you were a fan of the um, emo-ness <laughs> of this one, um, A, I recommend a little bit more Berlioz in your life, and B, you should check it, check out the poetry of Baudelaire and Edgar Allan Poe and Lord Byron. Highly recommend. And if you're into maybe some things that are similar levels of emotional expression but on the piano rather than orchestral a lot of people love chopin myself included i have a tiny bust of him three feet away right now (laughs) um and you might be into leashed who did a piano reduction of this piece as well if you kind of want to hear it in a different context same notes same melodies same things going on it's just all sort of reduced down onto one instrument. Are there any things that you want to suggest in the coda? Um, All of these things that Bailey just mentioned will be in the show notes. Oh, fun. um, Because spelling is fun. Yeah. 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 And if you're like me and you're looking for a place to start, like the show notes are a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. And we will endeavor to have them be as complete as possible may even add some things to them at the last minute since we always realize in editing what we oh, should have mentioned mm-hmm. <laughs> um i'd like to attach the video that mm-hmm. we yeah or at least i watched for yep this so that you can kind of see what we listen to um and what we're talking about yeah that might be a good idea to know what we're talking about yep i think i did that for the last episode for uh-huh. carmen i think i i attached oh, yeah, both you of the youtube videos I didn't do that because our last episode that I edited was a book. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I could have put a link to the book though. I didn't. Also, a slight update to transcripts. So, moving forward, we will be uploading these episodes to our YouTube page, which is Wild Sound Civilized Podcast. We will link that in the show notes as well. Um, And YouTube auto generates captions. So, if you need captions, you want to read along. As you listen, they will be there for you. There will be a little bit of a catch up, but moving forward, all of our new episodes will have captions. Thanks for listening. Wild Sound Civilized is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabewake and Attawandaronk peoples. Transcripts are available on our website. Our intro music is Fantasia in D minor by Georg Philip Telemann, performed by Bigley Duck. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Wild Sound Civilized with a Z. You can email us at wildsoundcivilizedpodcast at gmail.com. 
And if you liked what you heard here today, you can support us on patreon.com slash wildsoundcivilized.